Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. On behalf of Oyster Consulting, I would like to welcome, welcome you to our webinar, Are You Protecting Your Clients' Data? My name is Evan Rosser. I'm a director with Oyster Consulting, and I am joined today by two of my colleagues, Tim Buckler and Terry Schaefer. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the question pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and if we have time, address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. If we are not able to get to all your questions, we will reach out to you individually and share the questions and answers with the group. This webinar, uh, webinar is being recorded and everyone who registered will receive a link to the recording. Now I'd like to give you a bit of background on Oyster. Oyster Consulting was founded in 2008 and is made up of experienced practitioners. Our team of consultants brings to our clients enormous experience in the financial services industry. In addition to providing webinars and updates on new regulatory issues like GDPR and our recent webinars on the DOL fiduciary rule, we also provide services covering compliance and regulatory matters, operations and technology, trading and markets, finance and accounting, strategic management, and expert witness and litigation support. If you'd like more information about Oyster, please visit us at our website, oysterllc.com. Now, let me introduce our panel for today. First, we have Oyster consultant Tim Buckler. Tim has spent nearly 10 years in the financial service industry with a focus on compliance, cybersecurity, and data analysis. In addition to his experience conducting cybersecurity assessment, Tim has provided technical compliance support to numerous aspects of broker-dealer and investment advisors operation. Our second panelist is Terry Schaefer. Terry is a director with Oyster and has been a financial services executive with 30 years of experience in operations technology, finance, and compliance for investment banking capital markets, trading and derivative businesses in New York, London, and Tokyo, as well as individual and roll-up investment advisor firms. After today's session, we encourage you to reach out to us with any questions, and we would be happy to speak with you directly. You may reach us at our main number, our main phone number, 804-965-5400, or by going to our website and requesting a consult. One of our relationship managers will be happy to reach out to you. Today we will give you an overview of the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, or what everyone calls the GDPR. In our recent blog, we asked the questions, does your firm have a website? Does your firm use emails for sales and marketing? Does your firm have data about an EU resident? During this webinar, we will tell you why those questions and other questions are relevant to the GDPR and what that may mean for your firm. On May 25, 2018, GDPR goes into effect. Organizations anywhere in the world that process the personal data of EU residents will need to pay attention to GDPR and its territorial scope. The new regulation fundamentally changes the way organizations need to manage their people, policies, processes, and technologies. It is vital for organizations to understand this new regulation, this new legislation, and how it may impact them and ensure they are equipped, equipped to properly manage privacy and data protection. If you collect personal data or behavioral information from someone in the EU, your company will be subject to the requirements of GDPR. Now we won't make you experts on GDPR this afternoon, but Tim, would you please take us through an overview of this regulation? Sure, Evan. So while much of the discussion that I see is dedicated to the what of GDPR, many forget to consider the why of GDPR. So do you know all the companies that have your personal data or what data they have on you? 
Would you like to be able to tell them to delete your data? Would you like to easily change firms and have them send data to your competitors? I know of no individual that would be able to, to answer yes to these questions. And I know of no individual that wouldn't like to be, answer, be able to answer yes. Once GDPR comes into effect, EU residents will be able to answer yes. So GDPR is a European Union regulation that is aimed at protecting the data and data rights of EU residents. Under GDPR, these individuals are called data subjects. GDPR enumerates several data rights and also requires strong data protections, accountability, and breach notifications. GDPR will require firms to conduct an assessment to determine how they retain, use, and share data, as well as the authorization they have to do so. Firms may find that they do not have proper authorization to have some data and will need to delete it before GDPR comes into effect. Firms are not allowed to keep data without the proper authorization. The fines for lack of compliance can be substantial. GDPR will require firms to adopt or to adapt, adapt many policies, procedures, and documentation. Like Evan brought up before, GDPR comes fully into effect on May 25th of this year. GDPR's definition of protected data is much broader than U.S. standards of PII, or personally identifiable information. GDPR defines protected data as any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. Data related to businesses are not protected. Some data that falls under PII for GDPR includes name and address, economic data like income and transactional data, racial, sexual orientation, and political data. IP addresses, browser cookie data, and biometric data like fingerprints are all protected. Any data that you have that is tied to an individual should be considered protected data. There's been a lot of debate about who is and who is not a data subject. Unfortunately, the regulation doesn't specifically define the term of data subject. So we called the UK's Information Commissioner's Office, which is the authority overseeing GDPR in the UK for clarification. They said that data subjects are EU residents. Furthermore, EU citizens living abroad are not data subjects. But since this is not formally established, there may be some changes due to other regulation or enforcement, so firms will need to keep abreast of changes to GDPR in the future. There's another way that data is protected. Businesses that are established in the EU must protect the data of all persons, whether they are residents of the EU or not. OISA recommends that if possible, you treat all data as if it were regarding data subjects. Treating part of your data differently than others can be highly burdensome. Also, then you don't have to worry about who is and who is not a data subject. This will also allow you to more easily establish yourself in the EU in the future if you're not already. Terry, unlike many of our other topics that we've covered in our webinars and with our clients, the GDPR is not a financial or securities focused regulation, but one that applies to any business that has personal data. Can you tell us a little bit more about how, um, what financial firms in the U.S. might be affected by this? Right. Thanks, Evan. That's the burning question is, how, am I effective and how do I determine that? And you can make that determination by asking yourself some basic questions that we alluded to at the start of our, our presentation. Do I transact business in the EU? Do I have a physical location in the EU? Do I have employees or do I transact business in an EU currency? All of those scenarios could indicate you do business in the EU. Do I have a website that collects data from people within the EU? Do I perform data analytics on people who may have visited my website? Gathering someone's IP information and retaining it could subject you to oversight. Also, do, do I have clients that are located in the EU? Do I have contacts or client prospects in the EU? Any personal information I retain on my prospects could be subject to the rule, and my marketing campaigns need to have um, a specific legitimate business reason to contact an individual unless I have their express consent. And also, do I retain anecdotal personal information about a spouse or a family member that could also be considered applicable? Could I receive an email that I would retain in my database that includes PII, including just an identifiable email address? And lastly, do I import business data in any manner that originates from outside sources that are not controlled by me? And if so, I, I may be receiving GDPR protected data. So Tim, um, if firms have some of this data, what, what does the rule say about the processing of it? 
So first, GDPR defines two types of users of data, controllers and processors. Controllers are firms that are in charge of determining how data should be treated. Processors are the firms that actually conduct the processing. GDPR does not allow for controllers to assign any responsibility to processors and leave the controller risk-free. Ultimately, controllers are responsible for all GDPR requirements. Controllers can also be processors of themselves. Firms need to examine their third-party due diligence and agreements to make sure that anyone processing on their behalf will meet all requirements set forth in GDPR. GDPR considers data processing to include data retention, use, dissemination, backing, deletion of data. But firms need to understand that any time you have any data or use it in any meaningful sense, you should expect that to be processing. GDPR defines six frameworks that allows a firm a legal basis to process data. For all data, firms must know the legal process for process, legal basis for processing before any processing is conducted. Firms must know exactly how all their data is used, and it requires controls around the receiving of data. While some of the six frameworks are not that important for U.S. financial services firms, the two most important ones are legitimate interest and consent. Legitimate interest allows a firm to process data if it has a legitimate business interest. If your firm's business is required to process data and pursue into legal requirements, say KYC or CIP, or to conduct trades on their behalf, legitimate business interest would be the legal basis. This is likely to be used for most of the data your firm will process. Consent will be required for processing that is not in the normal legitimate interest of the business. Consent has serious requirements. It must be freely given meaning that there can be no change in the business relationship due to the giving or withholding of consent. Consent cannot be required to use a service or to become a client. Also, the consent must be specific, informed, and unambiguous. When the data subject is giving consent, they must know exactly what they're agreeing to, they must know that they are giving consent, and a layman should be able to read the form and understand exactly what they're agreeing to. Just as consent must be freely given, consent must also be withdrawable. The data subject at any time must be able to withdraw consent and your firm must stop processing their data, again with no changes in the business relationship. Consent must also be the last resort. You cannot use consent as a legal basis if you're using any other legal basis. Uh, a lot of financial firms use their best data for uh, legitimate business uses. Um, when and why will any uh, financial services firms in the U.S. need um, to obtain consent? So legitimate interest doesn't actually just mean business use. When determining whether legitimate interest is an appropriate legal basis, you must weigh the firm's business benefits and the harms to the data subject. There's also some processing connected currently within the industry that would unexpectedly not meet the standard of legitimate interest. One example is the gender of a client's spouse. Your firm may need to know the material, uh, the marital status of a client and can use legitimate interest for their data, but your firm doesn't have a legitimate interest in the gender of that spouse. Sexual orientation and gender are protected data, and you'll need consent to process that data. Data held in CRM tools are prime cases for needing consent. Firms must make sure they thoroughly examine their CRM data. So GDPR grants eight data rights. These allow data subject the ability to make certain actions to understand who uses their data and how. These rights can be exercised at any time. The right to be informed ensures that data subjects know about the collection and use of their personal data. This right is primarily about transparency. The right to access allows data subjects to request confirmation that the data is being processed and grants them access to that data. Basically, data subjects can come to your firm and ask for all the data you have on them and what exactly you do with each piece of it. The right to ratification pairs with the right to access. If a data subject believes that any of your data is inaccurate, they can provide you with corrected data and you must put the new data into place and stop processing the old data. This also requires that you coordinate with third parties to ensure that they also process the corrected data. The right to erasure which is commonly called the right to be forgotten, and the right to restrict processing and object are similar. They allow data subjects to request your firm delete their data or limit or stop its processing. There are caveats that allow your firm to continue processing for these three rights, like if you are legally required to retain their data.
One important note is that the right to object specifically provides that a data subject has the right to not be subject to marketing without their consent, which Terry will discuss later. The right to data portability allows data subjects to request that your firm send all their data to someone else, even if it's a competitor. This requires that your firm has all data exportable in a machine-readable format, and it cannot be in a proprietary format. Finally, the rights related to automated decision-making prevents firms from completely automating business decisions. Humans must be involved in the decision-making process. This is most applicable where actions like loan approval are taking place just with a computer. Importantly, this right can be waived, though. Uh, Tim, you covered a lot of ground there with uh, data processing and data rights. Uh, we know the, uh, the rule is effective May 25th. What's the time frame for firms uh, are, that, are, that firms are expected to be able to perform these actions and functions? So GDPR requires that you perform these actions or respond to the data subject within a reasonable time frame, which is generally 30 days. That's why it's so important to have these policies and procedures in place before GDPR comes into effect and data subjects start exercising their rights. So GDPR compliance means that firms should adopt a data protection by design and default approach. Your firm should be following all standard best practices, including encryption and pseudonymization. Data pseudonymization is when you remove the person's name or other information or replace it with a placeholder. So John Smith would become 12345. These two are especially important as if you have a breach, if your data is properly protected, you may not have to report the breach if the data subject is not identifiable. Role-based access management controls are also necessary. GDPR requires that your firm have controls preventing unauthorized access, including by employees that are not on a need-to-know basis. Your firm should also be conducting regular penetration and vulnerability tests. The frequency of these tests differ by firm, but annually at a minimum is commonly recommended. Your employees must also be trained. And GDPR will require that your firm create new policies and procedures, and all your employees that are client-facing should be knowledgeable of GDPR and be able to provide appropriate resources upon request. Your firm's website will also have to track data differently. IP addresses, form submission data, and cookies will all be subject to GDPR. If your firm does not need to comply with GDPR, your firm will still have to make changes to these. Every firm's website is accessed from the EU, and your firm needs to make sure that you're not processing data subjects' data without conducting uh, appropriate actions first. One critical issue with consent being the legal basis for data is that your firm must track who gave the consent, when that consent was given, and what the consent actually was with all the consent data. This cannot be kept in some of the database way off over there. It must be tied directly with the data. Say your firm has consent data in an Excel spreadsheet, you should be able to go to a different column and see any of the required consent information. GDPR's requirement for rights strongly requires your interaction with your firm's IT team. Your firm must be able to, at any time, know for all data who the data subject is, all locations that your firm holds that data, know how the firm uses that data, which third parties have access to the data, and how the third parties use it. If and how the data subject is consented must also be kept at all times. And you must be able to deliver or delete that data at any time. Firms should also determine if they must appoint a data protection officer or a DPO. A DPO is persons responsible for the firm's GDPR compliance, and they must be an expert on privacy and GDPR. GDPR sets out minimums for when a DPO must be appointed, but Oyster recommends that all firms have a DPO regardless of whether they meet the requirements. It's just that important. Tim, I know a lot of firms already have a strong data protection policy in place. What else do they need to do to be prepared for the requirements of GDPR? Well, GDPR doesn't actually set out any real requirements expressly. It basically requires that your firm follows all industry best practices. So if best practices change, so do your firm's requirements. Most firms do encrypt data, but some of them don't encrypt all of their data. Few firms use data pseudonymization. GDPR also requires that your firm minimize processing, which most firms cannot track. U.S. firms also do not consider much of the data they need to be protected by GDPR as PII. Firms will need to widen their security measures to all the data that they process.
So how do you actually handle a data breach? Um, GDPR requires that you notify the appropriate regulators within 72 hours of the detection of a breach. And at that time, you must be able to identify what data and data subjects were compromised, the consequences, severity of the data impacted, and the actions that your firm needs to take or is taking. Obviously, that is too much to do within 72 hours without proper planning by your firm. So you really need to make sure that these plans are in place you know, prior to you know, any sort of breach potentially happening. Oyster highly recommends that your firm puts an incident response plan into place now. Um, and understand that not all breaches are hacks. If an employee loses a laptop or if, if a thumb drive is lost or if sensitive documents are sent to the wrong recipient, they each may be considered a breach. Um, it's likely that breaches will be the manner in which most firms are discovered and fined. Um, your actions in response to the breach are going to impact the reaction that your regulators most likely will take. So, you know, a proper and timely response will really impact the regulator's evaluation of um, the breach after it's been communicated to them. Um, let's talk a bit about also about mass marketing. Um, there's been a proliferation of cost-effective, user-friendly client relationship management tools, or what we refer to as CRMs, and as well as mass marketing software that's made it easier than ever to send blast emails, social media outreach, and other forms of contact and notification to prospect, list, prospect lists you may have compiled through many different means over the years. Um, data subjects now have the right to object and not be subject to mass marketing without their consent. Um, this consent needs to be given before marketing outreach is made. Your firm cannot use a consent that was previously given that most likely does not meet GDPR strict requirements, even if that consent or contact information was given to you before GDPR comes into effect. There's no grandfathering of data. Since most email addresses you currently maintain were most likely given without G GDPR compliant consent, your firm may not be able to use their mass marketing email list after May 25th until you've reviewed it for compliance with GDPR. So this is going to mean that you're going to need to determine the residency status or location of your contacts and clients. And if you don't have the information to make that determination, you'll have to get it to determine if they're impacted. Um, firms should reach out to their email list before GDPR comes into effect and then gather the consent that's needed. This right applies to all forms of mass marketing, not just emails. All mass marketing policies must be examined and controlled and continuously updated and communicated out to your staff. Um, GDPR does not prevent business-to-business -business emails. So this means you can still email individuals for business purposes without running afoul of the right to object. And GDPR does not require that you still protect their, e does require, sorry, that you still protect their email addresses. Most business emails that people have um, contain the person's name or initials within the email address, so that by virtue is protected data. Um, GDPR will allow you to continue to buy contacts for mass marketing. However, you'll want to ensure that your list includes consent given by the data subjects. So businesses purchasing any sort of client list should ensure that future names or information they purchase are GDPR compliant. Um, the tracking of consents from your contacts can be very burdensome. Um, Oyster strongly suggests that your firm evaluate whether a CRM tool is appropriate for you. Many of the CRM tools will have ready program fields to track and flag the required information, and it saves having to build out your own workflows, it eliminates confusion with employees, and easily retains your data for any future audits. Um, you should verify that any software that you're using or evaluating is GDPR compliant. Well, let me ask you, um, 
Now you've got me wondering, if I go to a conference and I get a business card from a prospective uh, business partner or a prospective client, should I be afraid to use it? <laughs> what, what do I do with it now? No, that's a good question. Um, no, if someone gives you, your, you or your firm, their business card, um, that action will allow your firm to contact them. But a, a firm will only be allowed to market to that person in the context that the business card was given. So if your firm has two completely different lines of business and um, having that person's name doesn't allow you to email, to market to them on some completely unrelated topic. So you have to stay very specific to the reason why you got that person's contact in the first place. Um, so now we get down to fines. So fines for the most egregious of cases are allowed to be up to the greater of 20 million euros or 4% of global revenue. One question that's not addressed in the regulation is how U.S. firms will be fined. So GDPR does not directly set up a mechanism for non-EU enforcement, and it's something that the U.S. and the EU will need to negotiate in the future. This should not make U.S. firms complacent, though. The U.S. and EU have negotiated this type of privacy agreement before, an example being the EU-U.S. Privacy Shield. Um, it should be expected that even if not done immediately, that EU regulators will fine for infractions that date back to May 25th, 2018. So, you know, people should be ready, even though um, you, we may not see enforcements happen immediately, um, they could happen down the road and look back to the date of implementation. Um, now, what could be confusing in the beginning is that each member state of the EU will create their own regulatory authority. So while these authorities are required to work together, to make sure that they set similar levels of fines and other corrective actions, we can most likely expect that they will be, they will have some variance in how they oversee and, and levy their fines, and especially in the short term. So firms should also remember that they are also open to potential civil suits from individuals impacted by data breaches or non-compliant. GDPR does not address any limits for civil suits, but you should expect that they could, you know, as well be substantial. So how can Oyster help you? Um, there are several steps that companies should take prior to GDPR implementation, and Oyster is prepared to help whether you face substantial business assessment and policy and procedure enhancements, or you simply require an evaluation and ongoing controls to ensure you're not impacted. So our team can conduct a GDPR assessment and examine your preparedness. We also provide project guidance on how to become compliant, define which of your processes need to change, and assist you with drafting and updating any policies or documentation you require. Um, Oyster can also conduct cybersecurity assessments of your business and infrastructure, either for GDPR or for other standard security requirements your firm may have. Um, Oyster can help your firm with business continuity, disaster recovery, recovery and incident response planning. Um, we assist in drafting or editing plans, or we assist in the plan testing. So we can either help you create a plan for scratch, or we can just work with you to edit existing plans and, and identify areas that, that could be enhanced. Um, Oyster can also be an outsourced data protection officer, the DPO that Tim mentioned before for your firm. A DPO needs to be an expert on data security and GDPR, and your DPO needs to be prepared to set policy procedures and work with the public. Um, lastly, we can assist in helping your firm evaluate a CRM tool that meets your firm's needs and is GDPR compliant. There are a range of solutions from straightforward, inexpensive options to larger, customizable solutions. Okay. Well, thank you, Terry. Um, I have a couple of questions here, and I, on the first one, I, I think you've touched on this, but I want to make sure that we're clear. Firms already have uh, security breach procedures to address state and regulatory breach reporting requirements. If I have a breach of GDPR data, will I have to deal with several different country regulators? No, 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 you will not. Um, only one regulator will need to be contacted, and they will lead and coordinate any inquiry. 
um, you will most likely be contacting U.S. regulators if you're a U.S. firm. It, it just really depends on where your firm does most of their business and who their primary regulator is. Okay. Um, how about the con consent process? Let's go back to that for a minute. Um, the consent process under GDPR, how, how does that compare to what companies, what consent they gather now for their data? So consent under GDPR is, is very different than how most US, U.S. firms consider consent now. Most time consent now is just buried in some disclosure form with a whole bunch of other disclosures and no one even knows where to look to find it. But firms will need to get opt-in consent under GDPR and they do not allow for implied consent. Also, consent given before the deadline that does not meet the new GDPR standards will not be sufficient. Consent forms, when you have an actual form that is needing consent with, it must be a standalone document. It can't just be with any other form. They have to know when they look at it that it's a consent form. And firms must make sure that they are covering all their bases when they use it. it just, it's not just a, oh, sign this, box, sign this thing real quick and you're done. They have to actually make a real consent form that covers everything that needs to be covered. Uh, I, you had mentioned earlier that the consent form must give the customer the right to opt out at any time. If they do that, if the consent is withdrawn, what does the firm have to do? Do they have to delete all that data immediately? Well, first about withdrawing consent, it has to be as easy to withdraw consent as it was to give it. Now, most of the time, you're just signing a form, so your firm has to prepare a consent withdrawal form in response. Also, when your firm has the consent withdrawn for data, you need to be able to delete all the copies of the consent data within a reasonable time frame. This includes copies of redundant data held throughout your firm, any data on employees' desktops, paper data, even data in your backups. There are a lot of IT requirements in order to properly handle this, so you need to be aware of these before you get the data. Processes also need to be in place with third parties to make sure they completely delete the data. Um, another question that we have here is, is the U.S. definition of PII, personally identifiable information, different from the GDPR's definition of protected data? And how do I know if I have, if the data I have for clients and customers is protected data? So these really are two different standards. Any information your firm has tied to a specific individual in any way should be considered protected data. It's, if you can figure out who the person is in either way with that data, you should think that is protected data. So this will include, include like transactional data. Your firm having the price of GE stock is not protected. But knowing that John Smith owns 35 shares, that is protected data. The person's IP address, which is not considered PII in the US, is protected under GDPR. Firms really do need to conduct an assessment to examine all the data that they process because in practice, you'll find it might be easier to ask what isn't considered protected data. Um, I know there are still some uh, uncertainties and disagreements about the scope of the GDPR, as well as some territorial and jurisdictional questions about its applications. Um, and I think only time will answer some of those questions. Um, there are also questions, and I think Terry touched on this, about how the EU regulators will enforce the GDPR and levy fines and sanctions against non-EU entities. Um, that also is uncertain right now. However, many commentators have uh, advised not to underestimate the EU's desire to create uniform data privacy laws for its market and for its desire to protect EU residents' information. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, this is a, a regulation that applies to all firms, and that includes the Facebooks and the Googles and all the other social media sites. Uh, and I think the EU will be very diligent about enforcing uh, this rule's provisions. So while we know there are some un many unresolved issues, um, Tim and Terry, what advice and next steps uh, do we have for the firms in the U.S.? So the first and foremost step that you need to do is you need to understand the data that your firm processes by conducting an assessment. You need to review all your existing data, know who it belongs to, how you receive the data, if a consent is needed, if you have consent currently, 
you have to have policies and procedures in place to respond to all the data rights that data subjects are going to be exercising. Firms should also consider appointing a data protection officer. They're ultimately responsible for firms' compliance and getting them in place before the deadline may be required if your firm conducts certain types of activities. Right, and even in a smaller firm, I think you should still have some person set as the, you know, de facto um, data protection officer, just a go-to person if there's questions on the topic and, and yep. who can answer everything. Absolutely. Um, I, I think I just wanted to make a final comment. You know, the implementation of GDPR in the EU, I feel, is very topical right now with um, the recent data privacy, issue, it, privacy issues encountered by Facebook. And I just assume that this is going to drive further discussion in the U.S. around this topic. But in the meantime, you know, even though the U.S. laws are very different, um, we still need to be cognizant of the impact that the European laws have on you know, our business in the U.S. when we're dealing with European individuals and businesses? Well, that's a, that's a good point. Um, and another question that we have is, uh, does Brexit mean that U.S. firms don't need to worry about GDPR if they only have data on U.K. residents? No, um, it, 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 Brexit does not impact this at all. So GDPR goes into effect at the, towards the end of May, so that's going to be prior to Brexit. And the UK has already had um, discussions, and they've agreed to implement similar rules. So, um, you know, you need to be compliant today because they are part of it, and we don't expect that a significant change to, you know, what they would end up with after Brexit. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, that seems to be the end of our questions right now, and we are approaching the end of our session. And as always, thank you all for being part of our webinar, webinar today. As a reminder, we will provide you with a link to the recording of this webinar later this week. And please join us again for future webinars on GDPR, DOL, and other regulatory and compliance topics. If you, would have, if you have any questions or would like further information on how Oyster Consulting can help you and support you in this or any other change or compliance efforts, or support you with any of our financial services consulting needs, please go to our website, oysterllc.com, and request a consult, and one of our relationship managers will be in touch with you. You may also reach us directly at 804-965-5400. Thank you again for taking time out of your day to be with us, and we, will hope, and we hope you will join us for future webinars. Thanks again.